In this video, we're going to look at integration formulas and net change. Now this is section 1.4 in the Calculus OpenStax book, volume 2, but this is also the same material as you would see in section 5.5, the Calculus OpenStax book, volume 1. So if you're watching this in my Calc 1 class, don't panic. This is where we end in this quarter, and then it's also where we pick up in Calculus 2. So I, I like to have that crossover of finishing with the last two sections in Calculus 1 gets re-picked up as refreshers in Calculus 2. So this is one of those ones that you're going to see in both places. So don't panic where you see the title says 1.4. That's for Calc 2 students. It's 5.4 for my Calc 1 students. Now, if you're in the Calc 2, we've already learned substitution in our previous Calc class. And if you're not in Calc 2 and you're in Calc 1 and watching this video, you're going to be doing it in the next video. So if we take a look at this theorem that we're going to look at was the net change theorem. You, by this point, you should have been exposed a little bit to derivatives, antiderivatives, and integration. Now we know that the capital F is the antiderivative, and when you see capital F prime, that is our uh, derivative. And the second formula is the formula that we see more frequently is the integration from A to B of F, capital F prime of X dx, is the antiderivative of the function evaluated at B minus the antiderivative of the function evaluated at A. This is the one we see, but we can also get there by saying that if I evaluate my function, my antiderivative at B, it would be equal to the antiderivative evaluated at A plus the integration from A to B of F prime of X dx. The second one is the one that we see more frequently. If we were asked to integrate and we don't see limits of integration, then we're going to not worry about the net change. And that's what this is. This is the net change from A to B. And that's because what I'm trying to do at that point is I am trying to find, when I don't have limits of integration, see those A and B are not there. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find a family of functions, a family of antiderivatives that match this derivative. And so that's why we always have to put that plus C there. So I'm just going to rewrite this so it makes it easier for me to reverse the power rule because this is the power rule that got me to x, the square root of x minus 1 over the square root of x. So I'm going to rewrite this as x raised to the 1 half minus x raised to the negative 1 half dx. And that's because the negative comes from this negative 1 half comes from the fact that the x is in the denominator. So to bring it in the numerator, it should have a negative exponent. And of course, just as a really fresh, nice reminder, if your index is n of a, this becomes a raised to the 1 over n. And of course, without an index there, it's 2. So that's why it comes to 1 half. And you're like, I know this. And I said, I know you know this. But I just I like to refresh just a little bit. Now, the things I'm going to write in green are not actually there. They're just helping me do the housekeeping. So I'm going to add 1 to that 1 half. Because remember, to get 1 half as the answer when I took the derivative, I must have subtracted a power. So I need to add 1. And since the denominator is 2, I'm going to write that as 2 over 2. Now, I know I'm going to add 2 over 2 to that 1 half. And then I have to divide by that answer. So I would divide by 3 over 2 here. Again, this green is not part of the original antiderivative, and it's not part of the original derivative. It's just there for me to remind myself that I am undoing the derivative. And the same thing here is that 2, I'm going to add 1, which is 2 over 2, and then I'm going to divide by that 1 half. That's just helping me do my housekeeping. So when I divide it by a fraction, that is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of the fraction. So that is 2 thirds x raised to the 3 over 2. And this is going to be um, minus, and then x raised to the 1 half, and then of course it is 2, because that is a reciprocal of that 1 half. So my answer is um, 
2 thirds x raised to the 3 halves minus 2 x raised to the 1 half plus c because I'm not looking for the net change. I'm looking for the family of functions whose derivative is satisfied by the square root of x. Square root of x minus 1 over x squared. So any constant will satisfy that derivative. Okay. Now, on b and c, I am asked to actually do the definite integration and find the net change. And my answer could be positive or it could be negative. Now, remember, when I'm looking for net change, that's positive or negative. It could be a positive answer. It could be a negative answer. Now, if I want the total change, like I want the total distance, then when I do the integration, I'm integrating, I'm trying to find the total distance, then that is when I worry about where it crosses the x-axis and put in the absolute values everywhere to make sure that I'm positive the entire time. This is not one of those where we're doing net change, so I'm just going to do my integration here. When I integrate the sine, I must have started out with a negative cosine of x. And when I integrate cos negative cosine, I must have started out with a negative sine of x. I'm going to evaluate it from 0 to pi. Now, if you're not, if it's been a while since you've had derivatives, don't forget you can always check this d dx of the negative cosine of x. We know is going to be the negative negative sine of x. Oh, that's that one. And I can do the same thing with the cosine. So this is going to be negative cosine uh, evaluated at pi minus the sine evaluated at pi. It's the upper limit. That's my, my b, if you will, and this is my a. So this here is f of b. And then it's going to be minus, and then it'll be negative cosine of 0 minus the sine of 0. And of course, this is my f of a. We know that the sine of pi is 0. We know the sine of 0 is also 0, so those are nice. We know that the cosine of pi is negative 1, so it's a negative, negative 1, and then minus. And then in here I have the cosine of 0, which happens to be 1, so it is negative 1. And so I get negative, negative 1, which is a positive 1, uh, minus a negative 1, which is a positive 1. So my answer is 2. And that's the net change. Now, we haven't really talked about u substitution yet. Um, for my Calc 1 students, we have in Calc 2 because it's assumed you've, you ended your previous course with substitution, u substitution. And so I'm going to kind of introduce this now. And what I see is that if I were to say, hey, if I let u equal 1 plus 6t squared, then the derivative of this is going to be 12t dt. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because of this numerator, which has that 3t. I have 12t, not 3t, so I need to make that adjustment. So the way I make that adjustment is I'm going to divide both sides by 4. So I have 1 fourth du is going to give me 4, or excuse me, 3t dt. So 3t dt. Now, that allows me to say this 3t multiplied by that dt is going to get replaced with 1 fourth du. And I also know the value underneath the radical in the denominator is going to get replaced with u. Now, I have one of two choices at this point. My first choice is to go ahead and replace my upper and lower limit using this u substitution. That's my preference. The other way that you can do this is say, you know what? I don't want to take the time to do that, so I'm just going to put u1, u2 as, as placeholders. So here's your first option, option A. Option A is I need to know when t is equal to 0, what would u be equal to? Well, if t is equal to 0, u would equal to 1. When t is equal to 4, u would be equal to 4 squared plus or times 6 plus 1, which is 97. And you're thinking, where am I getting this? Well, here's my u substitution. I'm putting in 0 right here for t, 
And when I did that, I got u being 1. And then I have this upper limit of 4, so I put 4 in here for the t. So I get 1 plus 6 times 4 squared, which gives me the 97. So then my integration becomes my lower limit is 1, my upper limit is 97. And I have 1 over u raised to the 1 half multiplied by 1 fourth du which I would rewrite as, I would just go ahead and bring that 1 fourth out because I just like to do that, 1 over 1 to 97, u raised to the negative 1 half du. And then it's a really nice integration. Now that's option A. And if you don't like option A, then you can try option B. So I'm just going to erase this. I'm going to show you what option B would look like. So here's what option B would look like. is I would have the integration, and instead of replacing the upper and lower limit with the 1 and 97, I would replace the upper and lower limit with u1 and u2. Or even a and b is fine. And then I would still have the 1 fourth multiplied by 1 over u raised to the 1 half du. Now, if I go down this route, if I use option b, then I have to, after I do the integration, so I have 1 fourth the integration of u1 to u2 of u raised to the negative 1 half du. And again, the thing in green is not really there, so I do 2 over 2, and then I know this is divided by 1 half. This gives me 2 over 4 u raised to the 1 half evaluated from u1 to u2. If I go down to option B, then I have to back sub. So in other words, hey, this is what I have, but I can't do a direct substitution. I can't do the f of b minus the f of a because I have these u's here and I have these dummy variables as placeholders. So then I have to back substitute. So I have 1 half, and then I'm going to replace u with what I started out with, which is 1 plus 6t squared. So this will be the square root of 1 plus 6t squared Evaluated, now I back sub, u1 was 0, u2 was 4. And I'm going to get the answer. Now, if I would have stayed with option A, right, so here's option A, is I still would have the same integration from 1 to 97. And notice I don't have dummy placeholders. I don't do 0 and 4. Of uh, the 1 fourth out front, u raised to the negative 1 half du, it is still going to give me the 2 over 4 u raised to the 1 half, which is exactly what I have here, except for I can do a direct substitution. I don't have to take this extra step right here because I did the extra step earlier. And so I get 1 half, 97 raised to the 1 half minus 1 half, and then 1 raised to the 1 half. And then whatever that answer is. So I personally don't care. However, I just want to say I don't care. But what I don't want to see, because it would be wrong, it is incorrect for you to mix this up and do this and say, okay, well, I'm going to go from 0 to 4 of 1 fourth, 1 over u raised to the 1 half du, because that is not correct. If you're going to do a u sub, then either you need to have dummy variables, u1, u2, as placeholders, for your limits of integration. You only have to do this for the limits of integration. Or you need to change them out at the beginning. I personally don't care. I don't care what you choose to do, I should say. I prefer to do it right out of the gate so I don't have to back step and I don't have to remember to back step. I just want to do it right as we go. I'm there anyways, just get it done. Now, let's take a look at um, D now. D is a really nice, really nice integration. Again, Everything that I'm going to do in green is not there. That's just there to help me out. So I'm going to add 1. So I'm going to divide by 4. I'm going to add 1 and divide by 3. I'm going to add 1 to that 1 and divide by 2. And so I end up with 1 fourth x raised to the 4 minus 2 thirds x raised to the 3rd plus uh, 2 x squared. And I'm going to evaluate this at negative 1 to 1. And so I put my upper limit in first, so 1 fourth, 1 raised to the fourth, minus 2 thirds, and then that x gets replaced with 1. 
raised to the third, that's a terrible one, plus two, and then one raised to the two. All of this is my f of b. And then I would subtract off one fourth, negative one raised to the fourth. Make sure that in your calculator that you put that negative in parentheses when you raise it to the fourth, because just as a friendly reminder, negative one raised to the fourth is not the same thing as negative one raised to the fourth, where the negative one is in parentheses, just as a friendly reminder. So moving on, we have minus two thirds, negative one raised to the third, and then plus two, negative one squared. And you'd put that in your calculator and or use that um, just basic math. And this is f of a. This represents the net change, total change. Now here's some applications. Suppose a particle moves along a straight line with acceleration to find a of t is equal to t minus three, and t is going from zero to six. Find the velocity and the displacement at time t and the total distance traveled. Now, the key word here is total. We're not looking for the net distance traveled. We're talking about the total distance traveled. And this is what I mean by the difference. Suppose this is where my house is and my work is down here and then it's south. So this is work. And I drive south. So I drive south 15 miles. And then I decide I want to go up to Olympia. So I'm going to drive up to Olympia, Washington, and I am going to drive up um, however, I think it's 20 miles from my house plus that 15. So from work, I've gone 35 miles north. Now my net change, if I stop in Olympia and I stay there, my net change is going to be 20 miles positive, right? Because it's above and we consider it above being positive. So it's positive. My total, total, however, is going to be the 15, which is a negative absolute value because negative means I'm going south, plus that 35. Now, I don't need the absolute values around the 35, but I'm just going to put it on there just to be safe. And so my total distance traveled from my house to work and then back up to Olympia is not the net change. So that's what this is saying. Hey, you know what? I want the total distance traveled, not the net distance. Now, if I then went back home, right, so I go to Olympia and I go back home, this is an example where if this was my day, my net change is zero, but my total distance traveled is not zero. So that's what it means. So just be aware that if they're asking for the total distance traveled, it is not simply just integrating. It is finding where your graph would be above and below the x-axis and then breaking it apart to make sure that you are um, taking the absolute values where appropriate. Now, another thing that we need to talk about just as a nice refresher is that if you have the position, we'll call it S of T, this is your position. If you take the derivative of T, I know that looks like a delta, it's in my S, don't be mean. My derivative, my first derivative is my velocity. Now my second derivative of my position function, which is the first derivative of my velocity, is my acceleration. They're giving me the acceleration. So I'm gonna have to work backwards, which means I'm gonna have to integrate to find the antiderivative. So I'm gonna start out with my acceleration. So my acceleration is a of t and dt. This will give me my velocity. So I'm going to integrate my a of t, which is t minus 3 dt. Nice, easy integration. We know this is going to be t to the 2 divided by 2 minus 3t plus c. Now this is my velocity equation. And you're like, how am I going to find that plus c? Well, the way I'm going to find my plus c is I have this initial value. This is, this is what we call an initial value problem. So I know when my, when my t is equal to zero, my velocity, so this would be t is zero squared divided by two, three multiplied by zero plus c, my velocity is 
equal to 3 when my time is 0. So that tells me c is equal to 3. So my velocity, v of t, is going to be equal to t squared divided by 2 minus 3t plus 3. That's my velocity equation. Now I've got to find my displacement, so I need to integrate this. So I'm going to integrate this because I know my position function is equal to the integration of my velocity function. Okay, so I'm going to integrate this, and again, don't forget I'm going to do plus 1, and then I'm going to divide by that 3, and then plus 1 and divide by 2, and then it just gives me t here. So I end up with t to the third divided by 6 minus 2 or 3 halves t squared plus 3t plus c. Now this is my position function. You're like, how am I going to find this plus c? Well, I'm going to go back to this. And they use d. I'm going to use s, whatever. s of 0. 0 to the third divided by 6. 2 thirds multiplied by 0 squared plus three, 0 multiplied by 3 plus c is equal to 0. That means my c is equal to 0. So I found my position function. My s of t is equal to t cubed divided by 6 minus 3 halves t squared plus 3t. I've found my position function, and I have found my velocity function. I haven't completely answered the question, but I do know what my position is at any given time, and I know what my velocity is at any given time. So now what we're going to do is we're now going to answer the final part, which is what is your total distance traveled? Now, what we know is that if I take my velocity function, which is t over 2 divided by 2, minus 3t plus 3 dt, and I evaluate this now. So if I take my velocity and I integrate it, it gives me my position, and I integrate it from 0 to 6, this is going to give me the net change. And you remember from my example, that's not my total distance traveled. That is my net change. So what I need to do is I need to find out whether or not my net change will be my total distance traveled. So I'm going to take t squared divided by 2 minus 3t plus 3 and set it equal to 0. I'm going to multiply everything by 2 and I get t squared minus 6t plus 6 is equal to 0. And that doesn't really factor very nicely, so I'm going to put in the quadratic. So t is equal to 6 plus or minus the square root of 6 squared minus 4 times 6 multiplied by 1 divided by 2. And so t is equal to 6 plus or minus the square root of 36 minus 24 all divided by 2. So t is equal to 6 plus the square root of 12, which is 2 root 3, 2 root 3 divided by 2. And t is also equal to 6 minus 2 root 3 divided by 2. We can kind of clean this up a little bit. This is 3 plus 2 root, 3 plus root, excuse me, square root of 3, square root of 3. And also, this is t is equal to, and then I would have uh, 3 minus the square root of 3. Okay, so what this tells me is in that interval, well, in that interval, between 0 and 6. So let's see which one of these are actually in the interval between 0 and 6. So 3 plus the square root of 3. This t is approximately equal to 4.732. And then 3 minus the square root of 3 gives me approximately 1.26. And I'm going to round this to 8. Okay, so actually... This thing crosses twice in that narrow between 0 and um, 6. So the way I'd set this up is I would set this up as the integration from 0 to my first crossing, which is 1.268. 
of um, V of T dt. And if I wasn't sure if it was above or below the x-axis, I would put an absolute value on the final answer. Plus, and then I would integrate the next interval, which is 1.268 to the 4.732 V of T dt. And then I, again, if I'm not certain if it's above or below the x-axis, whether it would produce a positive or negative, I'd put on absolute values. And then I would do my last one, which is 4.732 to 6 V of T dt and slap on the absolute value. Now, I happen to know that if I were to graph this lovely thing, it would look like this. Here is the first crossing. This is 1.268. Here's my second crossing, 4.732. It's a quadratic with its leading coefficient that's positive, so I happen to know this is about what the shape would be. So when I went and integrated this, this portion of the graph would be a positive answer, and this portion of the graph would be a positive answer, and this portion of the graph would be a negative answer. So the only really true place I need to have absolute values is in this middle piece. But if I didn't know to be on the safe side, I would put absolute values on every single one of them and then add it up. And when I add it up, when I integrate this and add it up, this will give me my total change or the total distance in this case. Okay, so I'll let you finish that off. Now, here's another one. In this example, we're asked to find the displacement at time t and the total distance traveled. So they're not given us the acceleration, so we don't have to integrate twice. We only have to integrate once, so let's start with our first integration. We know our d of t or s of t is the integration of v of t dt. So if I were to integrate this, it would be t squared minus 3t minus 18 and dt. I don't have any limits of integration, so um, they're not asking me for the um, total displacement, or they're asking me for the total distance traveled. But they're not asking me for the net, so I don't have any limits of integration to put on there, so I'm just going to integrate this. And again, I like to remind myself to do this so that when I do the integration, I'm going to have one-third t cubed minus 3 over 2 t squared minus 18 t plus c. And the difference between this one, besides the fact I'm using a d instead of s, doesn't really matter, uh, is the fact that I don't have an initial value. So I don't know what c is going to be. I have no idea what the initial value is. So I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what the position is without having an initial value, and it's not given to me. So I'm just going to leave it as a plus c. Okay, so... Then the next one we're going to look at is the, the total distance traveled. So once again, I'm going to take the velocity equation and see where if, if, if and where it crosses the x-axis. This one factors nicely. So this is t minus 3, excuse me, t plus 3 and t minus 6. So the velocity factors nicely. So when t is equal to the negative 3, and when t is equal to 6 is the two places in which I'm crossing the x-axis. So negative 3 and 6, and this is what the graph would look like. Now, I'm going from 0 to 6. In 0 from 6, that's this region. If I were to integrate this without slapping an absolute value sign on that, then what would happen is I would end up with a negative answer. Total distance traveled shouldn't have a negative or a positive. Or actually, let me rephrase that. Total distance traveled should always be positive. Negative tells you directionality. We're not asking for directionality. We want to know how far did we travel total distance. So what I would do is I would integrate this from 0 to 6, and I would slap on the absolute value of this, the in total thing. And I don't even have to break this up because between 0 and 6, there's no other places in which this quadratic t squared minus 3t minus 18 is crossing the x-axis. So I would just integrate this, and then I would take the absolute value of that answer. Now, here are some things that will help us when we're integrating even and odd functions. 
recall from pre-calculus one, this is like way back, if I replace negative x into the original function and no sign changes, I have the original function, that means the graph is even and it's symmetric about the y-axis. Odd functions satisfy the fact that if I put in a negative into my function, negative x or negative theta, and every sign changes, or in other words, I have the function, the exact opposite of the original function, then we say that it is symmetric about the origin. And it's an odd function. So if we know it's an even function, and I want to go from negative a to a, I can evaluate it as 0 to a and multiply the answer by 2. If it's an odd function, and I'm going from negative a to a of f of x dx, the answer is always going to be 0. So I'm going to look at my limits of integration from negative 4 to 4 negative 4 to 4, and I'm looking at cosine. Cosine happens to be an even function. So since this is an even function, I can evaluate this as 0 to pi over 4, multiply the answer by 2 of the cosine of x dx. It's going to give me the exact same answer as if I would have done the entire integration from negative uh, pi over 4 to pi over 4. So I'm just going to do this one, and so I get 2. If I ended up with cosine as my derivative, I must have sign, started with the sine of x going from 0 to pi over 4. So this is going to be 2 times the sine of pi over 4 minus, put this in parentheses, the sine of 0. The sine of 0 is 0, so that's nice. So this is 2 root 2 over 2, so my answer is square root of 2. Now, let's take a look at my next one. This is negative pi halves to pi halves, so they match, negative and a positive. 5, well, okay, 5 doesn't really do much. I can bring that 5 out, so I can write this as 5, negative pi halves to pi halves of the sine of x dx. And you're like, okay, so how do I know? Well, sine is odd. And you're like, I still don't know. That's when you look at that two-page trig formula sheet that I give you. Odd and even information on trig functions are right there. So this ends up giving me 0 because it's an odd function. Sine is odd, and I'm going from negative pi halves to pi halves, or negative a to a, if you will, and so I know the answer is going to be 0. Let's take a look at my last one. And you're thinking, wait a minute, cosine. Cosine and it's even, but I'm not going from negative pi halves to pi halves. Well, a cosine wave looks like this, right? We start at the angle being 0. My output is 1. And it cycles through like this all the way to 2 pi. Here is pi over 2. Here is pi. And here is 3 pi over 2. Now, here's the deal. This and this add up to this region. So this is also equal to zero. And that's it for this section.